everyone. What a great turnout this is. I, I'm, I'm just blown away. This is wonderful. I, know, I knew Phil and Lisa had a lot of friends, but this is great. And food helps too. The word must have gotten out that Lisa was serving. So <laughs> my name is Marsa Fraser. I'm the Special Collections Librarian here at Williamson County Public Library. And my assistant is here, Paige Hurley. Please stand up. Um, Paige. <laughs> and Paige and I have, are really invested in this book. And I, I can tell you more about that later, but we, we were coaches for Phil as he was building this book on a platform. So we didn't write it, but we helped him make it a book. And uh, it was just a pleasure working with Phil and eventually with Lisa too. So welcome. And uh, just a few things I'd like to tell you about Special Collections Department. We do sponsor programs like this, and we have a few coming up. I'll just let you know, if, you're, if you don't get the library newsletter, it comes out once a week, and it tells you everything that's going to go on the next week in the library. You can register for that on the library's website. The main page just, I think it's even up at the top, isn't it, Paige? You just sign up for the newsletter. You won't regret it because we've got some great programs. Coming up in our department, we've got lineage societies. If you've ever thought about joining a heritage society like DAR or one of those, uh, the Jamestown uh, Society, the Mayflower Society, we do have a program explaining all of that in the application process. We have a program coming up in January called Social Media Marketing. So if you're trying to sell something, that might be something you'd in be interested in coming to. And we also have another program coming up in January uh, about DNA and DNA matching. So if any of you have done your DNA and you can't understand what Ancestry or 23andMe is trying to tell you, this might help you get started. After the presentation, Phil will be here to answer questions or sell books or just talk to you about the process. Um, I hope you managed to get some refreshments. They're delicious. Uh, the books will be on sale after the program as well. They're $35 plus tax. And I think Phil will take any kind of money that you can bring <laughs> up there. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit about Phil, and I've, I've uh, pieced this together, but you know, Phil grew up in Franklin, and he actually grew up with, like a lot of you did, playing uh, on historic sites. For him, it was Fort Granger. He graduated from Franklin High School in 1976. He holds two degrees from Aquinas College in Nashville. He's retired from Nashville Electric after 36 years of service. He's a history and movie buff, loves writing, gardening, martial arts, travel, and music. His wife, Lisa, is also a lifelong resident of Williamson County, and she's with him here tonight, and she brought all the food. So I know you'll want to thank her for that. <laughs> well, we're so thrilled that Phil found his way to the Special Collections Department. I think word had gotten out that we began, we have a, a professional publishing platform that we help local authors. They can use it for free. And we kind of coach local authors in building their books. We don't write the books, but they bring their written material and we coach them through getting it into a platform so that their book uh, looks professionally published. And it really is. By the time this, Folks, this is a beautiful book. It really is. And you open it up and you would think a, a publishing a house put made. this out. <laughs> what? It, it looks like a sane person. Made. It looks like a sane person wrote this book. <laughs> we had nothing to do with the writing, but I've read so much of this and the content is wonderful. I'm, I'm just as proud of this as Phil is, I think. We've watched it grow, and we've watched it turn into a book. 
and it's uh, an ex it's a very exciting process. Um, Phil has created just a fascinating account of the last months of the Civil War. He's told the story of greed, corruption, incompetence when a government chartered Mississippi River paddle wheel boat, the Sultana, is headed north, loaded with over 2,000 prisoners of war, paroled prisoners of war from the Civil War. They were going home. I'm going to let Phil tell you the rest of the story. It's a great honor to have Phil here with us tonight. Phil? Thanks. Thank you all so much for being here. A uh, uh, round of applause for Marcia. Uh, applaud until her face turns red. Look, it's working. Yeah, uh, people have asked me why I wrote it. And uh, when I first heard about the story of the Sultana, uh, I was fascinated by it. And I didn't understand how something so big could happen. Yet most of the general public never heard of it. And uh, as I explored that, you know, I figured out kind of why it was swept under the carpet and why it was forgotten and relegated to the back page. I, I, I love historical nonfiction. Uh, the first time I heard about the Sultana was in 92. I read uh, Jerry Potter's book, uh, The Sultana Tragedy, and uh, it's a wonderful account of it. And uh, the story goes that Jerry Potter, he, he's an attorney in Memphis, and he walked into a bank in Memphis, and there was a uh, picture of a burning boat on the wall in the bank. And he just asked, well, what is, what, what is this? What's the story of this? And uh, the banker said, oh, that's the Sultana. He said, well, wh what about the Sultana? Oh, can you not hear me? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he said, what about the Sultana? Uh, he said, yeah, you know, more people died in this tragedy than died in the, the Titanic. He said, really? So fast forward, you know, like a dozen years later, and he wrote this account. A few years after that, a uh, retired police officer wrote another account. A guy named uh, Gene Eric Salaker wrote a real good account of, of the story. After I read those two books, I was, I was transfixed by the story. And the way I created it, the way I created this is I, every good story has an arc. It has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there'll be like a, a crisis, a resolution, and a climax somewhere along the way on the story arc. So what I did is I went to the end of the story arc, the Sultana tragedy, and just backtracked. And I, I asked myself, well, what, ha what else happened that day? What, what could have possibly taken the attention away from such a tragic moment? And well, what happened that same day at, at practically the exact same moment that they were fishing the survivors out of the Mississippi River, John Wilkes Booth's body was being delivered to Washington for a secret burial. And then I said, well, what happened the day before that? Well, John Wilkes Booth and his accomplice, uh, Davy Harold, was deliberately locked into a tobacco barn on Richard Garrett's farm by his two old, oldest sons, John and William. Really, what happened before that? And so I just kept backtracking. And then I developed this timeline to create the story arc. And it practically begins at Andersonville, which is where the men came from in the first place. They came from Andersonville and Cahaba prisons. Those, those are the men that ended up on this boat. So that, that's the story arc. It begins there and goes through all the way to the tragedy. One of the things I learned was there was nothing new under the sun. You, you think about greed, the greed, and the corruption, and uh, it's been going on since time immemorial. You know, so I created the story, the, the timeline. Most of the timeline is within the month, the confines of the month of April. April 9th is a Palm Sunday. The surrender at Appomattox. A couple days later, three days later, Lincoln has, uh, he has not slept probably in uh, four or five days. He might have slept an hour here, an hour there, but he was terrorized by nightmares. And you'll find out what those nightmares contain, and it was really spooky, given what happened later, that he was shot 
in Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth. Ten days later, Booth is delivered to the Garrett Farm, and that was his hideout until he was captured. Booth was shot and killed on the Garrett Farm, as I expressed a minute ago. And then there's uh, the slide that shows that Booth's body was delivered about the same time as the Sultana explosion. This book is divided, uh, and I, by the way, I appreciate you, you guys that bought the book. That's great. Thank you for doing that. This book is divided primarily into five parts. The part about Andersonville, Captivia, and Inferno, Conspiracy and Surrender, Sicarius, The Journey Home, and The Aftermath. This guy here, this is the boat captain of the Sultana. This is Captain Mason, James Cass Mason. Uh, he uh, was born in Virginia, but he moved as a child to St. Louis, and that's where he grew up. And he married well. He married into a family uh, last name Dozier. And his father-in-law, uh, Mr. Dozier, owned a paddle wheel boat, which he allowed his son-in-law to become the captain of. Well, he did okay with that, and he was uh, an able navigator and operator. And he did okay until the boat was seized by the Union forces uh, for allegedly transporting Confederate contraband. He lost his job, and his father-in-law lost a boat. He married his daughter, uh, Mr. Dozier's daughter, Rowena. And incidentally, the boat was named after his daughter, so he was the captain of the Rowena. And that was the boat that was seized uh, for uh, hauling contraband. He was also, Captain Mason was also regarded by others in the business uh, of, of being a riverboat captain as being a bit of a speed demon. You know, these boat captains, a lot of them run up, the, up and down the Mississippi River, running the same routes and the same faces, same captains you see, uh, you know, every day. And uh, sometimes they make a little side wager. They say, well, uh, Captain, ahoy, Captain, where's your next stop? Oh, I'm going to Vicksburg. He's okay, I'll race you. So they'd race these, these paddle wheel boats up the river, and uh, they would get a trophy. Uh, it was an odd trophy, and I'll tell you about that later. Okay, the Sultana itself, uh, it was uh, built in Cincinnati in early 1863. And it was built for Captain Preston Lodwick, and it cost $80,000 to build this boat in 1863, which is like $1.5 million. So it's, it's a fine, big boat. Uh, it was built originally for the lower Mississippi cotton trade. That was how they transported the cotton up and down the Mississippi River. Uh, it was sold to uh, Captain Mason and a group of investors about a year after that as a used boat. Uh, this, uh, at about the same time that Andersonville Prison was being constructed, that was when this uh, Captain Mason and a group of investors bought the, the Sultana. All right, this is a kind of a rare picture of, of Andersonville, the, the inside of Andersonville. Uh, that, uh, there's a stream that ran through uh, the stockade, and they recalled it, named it Stockade Branch. And those makeshift tents were called shebangs. When they got there to Andersonville, they were supposed to provide housing. They were going to build cabins, some kind of lodging, and they never did. It just happened so fast. Uh, early on in the war, uh, the exchange program between the Union and Confederate forces was, was uh, conducted, well, I'm going to oversimplify it, but it, it would almost be as simple as the two opposing generals would meet on a battlefield, and uh, one, one general would say, uh, how many you got, sir? And he'd say, oh, I got a thousand privates and 50 captains or whatever, and they would make the exchange, and there would be paperwork ex exchange, and they would go behind their uh, corresponding picket lines and the war would continue. So, uh, and it worked well, especially for the Confederacy. And then eventually it got to where they could not agree on the terms of, of the exchange. So, you, as you would imagine, the population exploded. The prison population uh, at that time, uh, they were taking most of the Union captured soldiers to Richmond. There were three prisons in Richmond. There was Libby, uh, Bell, uh, Belle Isle, uh, and Castle Thunder. 
there, there were three prisons there in Richmond. And when they got overloaded and they got full and they couldn't take any more prisoners, they started commandeering uh, tobacco and cotton warehouses and crammed them in there until they got so full. Uh, finally, the uh, uh, Secretary of War for the Confederacy, James Seddon, said, we've got to do something. Uh, we're, we're bursting at the seams with prisoners. So he sends the order down. They need to build a prison camp, and it, it needs to be in this general location, southwest Georgia. So uh, that order fell to, uh, to, the cat, uh, to uh, General uh, John Henry Winder. I think I got a picture of him. It fell to John Henry Winder, and uh, so he dispatched his son, Captain uh, William Sidney Winder, to go find a spot to build uh, the prisoner war camp. So he sends him to southwest Georgia, and they tried to establish a prisoner of war camp at um, Albany. And the, the residents of Albany was not going to have any of it. They said, you're not putting a prison camp here. So they found a, a small town called Americus, Georgia. I don't know if anybody ever, ever been there. There's nothing there, really. And along the same line, they found a, a small village, which is about the size of Leaper's Fork. Uh, you locals know about it. It's about that size. It had a train depot, and it's a little village called Anderson. And so he said, yeah, it's a good spot. Well, there was some confusion about mail delivery. There was another town nearby called Anderson as well. So they renamed the village Andersonville. It was built, this prison camp was built in Sumner County, Georgia. So it was actually, the, the official name was Camp Sumter. But everyone eventually called it Andersonville. As I said, uh, he sent his son, William Sidney Winder, to select the site, and his nephew was assigned the responsibility of actually uh, overseeing and supervising its construction. They selected the site for, for a number of reasons, but three reasons was they found two property owners that were willing to lease the property to the Confederate government, two men named Benjamin Dykes and William Turner agreed to lease the property. Second reason they chose it was because it had rail service. It was daily rail service where they could bring in materials, soldiers, and prisoners. And the third reason is because that stream that ran through it, they said, we got, we got water where they have drinking water. They used it as a latrine. They used it as a drinking water and bathing water. And as you can imagine, it got polluted relatively fast. In, 18, in 1863, uh, the Confederacy passed the Impression Act of 1863, and what that was, was it imposed upon the Confederate citizens that they would tithe, you know, they were ordered to tithe 10% of everything they had and everything they could produce, their food, their livestock, their slaves. So if uh, a plantation owner had 100 slaves, he had to give 10 of them up to the, to the Confederate government to do with as they saw fit. So what the result was, they sent 900 of those commandeered slaves to build Andersonville prison camp. So for days on end, or actually it was months, the slaves would dig a five foot deep trench around the entire perimeter of where the prison camp was gonna be and chop down pine trees nearby. And they would stand these pine trees as logs vertically into this five foot deep trench to construct a perimeter fence around the entire camp. And by the time the first influx of prisoners were brought to Andersonville, the walls were not even finished. So they had an opening in the fence, so they had two regiments, Alabama and Georgia regiments, that would stand guard and hold guns on the prisoners and on the slaves while they finished constructing this wall. And uh, one prisoner in particular that walked through the gates early on the first prisoners arrived on February 24th, 1864. February 28th, four days later, a man named Robert Sneeden, Robert Knox Sneeden, walked through the gates of Andersonville. This is Robert Knox Sneeden. He was a Canadian by birth. He came here because he wanted to be an architect. That was his, his passion to become an architect. So he came here to further his education particularly New York, where they were build, starting to build skyscrapers, and that was what he wanted to do. Well, not long after that, the war broke out. He enlisted, as, as all the young men were expected to do, at service time, and he was caught 
uh, early on in the war. And like I said, he was one of the first prisoners to walk through the gate at Andersonville. He was about 28 or 29 years old when he was captured. He was assigned to the quartermaster's department and their job was to supply uh, the, the soldiers were the things they needed, the canteens, their uniforms, their ammunition, their shoes. So after a while, they started to recognize Robert Sneeden's true talent. And it was, his true talent was artistic. He could draw uh, real well. And uh, at that moment of the war, early on, uh, topographical maps of the South were not available to the Union. Uh, if there was a map, they wasn't giving them up. So they had to create their own maps and they were at a, at a disadvantage because they, you know, if you're trying to move 10,000 men and you don't want to end up going, trying to ford a river that you shouldn't. So these maps were critically important to General Meade's uh, ability to move troops. So they, they saw, hey, this guy is really good. He draws real detailed drawings. He draws to scale. He's got some skills. Why don't we put him to work as a map maker? And that's what happened. They put him to work. He had a lot of tricks where he could make his scale work for him. He would uh, measure the gait of, of a horse and count the steps. And he could make accurate um, estimations of the distance. He would tie um, a, a rag around one of the spokes of the wagon and he knew the circumference of the wheel and he would count the revolutions as it went up, went by and he could make r real detailed, accurate maps. Uh, he was originally held in a tobacco, one of those tobacco warehouses I was talking about in Richmond until there was some escape problem and they had a yellow fever epidemic. So they started moving prisoners. That's why they started moving prisoners so fast to Andersonville, even before the walls were finished. <laughs> This is General John Henry Winder. By all accounts, he was a despicable man, and he was a, a drunkard and a bully, and he, he was an effective general, but uh, he was not very well liked, and he was the very first commandant of Andersonville. It was his son that selected the site, and it was his nephew that supervised its construction. And, and uh, there's a report where one of the inmates documented it because he witnessed it, that he would point to the 3,086 freshly dug graves at Andersonville on the other side of the tracks and brag that he was doing more for the uh, Confederacy than 40 regiments. And he was probably right because uh, they killed more in the prison camps practically than they did on the battlefield. Eight weeks after uh, he took charge of Andersonville. He was promoted, General Winder was promoted to be in charge of all prisons in Alabama and Georgia. So he had to uh, delegate that responsibility of, of whoever was gonna run the prison and be its new commandant so he could go to his new position. And that's when he assigned that responsibility to a uh, man named Captain Henry Wurz. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Henry Wurz, but he's pretty well reviled, just as much, if not more, than General Winder. General Winder, he, he was probably saved from the hangman's noose because he died before the end of the war of a heart attack. By a show of hands, has anybody ever been to Andersonville? Yeah. There's not much there, right? Yeah, like, it's kind of, but if you go there and you go to the site where the prison camp was and just do a 360, it's a beautiful place. You know, it's, it's southern... You know, it's Southern beauty, it's rolling land. Uh, you wouldn't think it would be the saddest place on earth, but that's what it's nicknamed is the saddest place on earth. This is Captain Wurz, the man that took charge of Andersonville eight weeks after uh, General Winder had, had run it. Uh, he was uh, originally from Switzerland and he came, he was sentenced to, four year, to a four year prison term because he, he had uh, debt that he was unable to pay. I, uh, evidently, Switzerland had a debtor's prison. So he was sentenced to four years, and that sentence was commuted to a 12-year exile, forced exile. They had made him leave the country. He was married at the time. Uh, he, he first landed in Russia uh, for about the first year, and after that, he came to America. Uh, his first stop was in Boston, Massachusetts. His wife refused to go with him on his exile, 
she didn't want to go, so they got a divorce. And he served in a number of jobs in the States. Uh, he wanted to be a physician, but he couldn't afford the education. So he ended up being a plantation overseer and physician, you know, finger quote, physician for the slaves. He uh, enlisted in the Confederate Army uh, early on, and he was wounded uh, and lost the use of his right arm. Uh, if, uh, if you notice, he's got his right arm kind of tucked into his vest there. He lost the use of his right arm, so he couldn't be uh, reassigned to active duty. So they assigned him to uh, the Commission of Prisons Department, and that's how he ended up working under General Winder and getting promoted to eventually be the Commandant of Andersonville. One of the first moves that he made after he took command of uh, Andersonville was he had a, what was called a deadline constructed. It was a light fence. It looked kind of like a hitching post. It was about 19, 20 feet inside the stockade wall. And you wonder, you might ask, well, why, why would he do such a thing? Well, that was to keep people back away from the wall because they figured out pretty soon, hey, it's a five foot trench that this wall is constructed in. If we can tunnel five feet, six feet below that, we're free. So he decided he wanted to kind of thwart their escape efforts, had this deadline built, and then the orders were to the men in the pigeon roost, they called them pigeon roost, along the wall, they spaced them about every 30 feet with rifles. If anybody gets close enough to even touch that deadline, you're supposed to shoot them dead. No warning. So that's one of the first moves he did. He was trying to control the escape effort uh, by making them get back away from the wall. This is another picture inside. Uh, that's one of the shebangs. That was the only cover they had. It, it was uh, tragic. It, and not everybody had access to one, so they would have to share. And they would have to sleep under these scant covers in stack spoon fashion to try to get out of the weather. It was the only way they had to get out of the elements, whether it was rain, snow, or blistering sun. That's all they had. And some of them, it was like spokes in a wheel where all they could get under the cover was maybe their shoulder and head and their legs and abdomen be, you know, outside in the elements all day. The, uh, the, the inmates uh, suffered with dysentery, uh, uh, scurvy, uh, chronic diarrhea, they had no medicine, uh, it was really miserable. And the Raiders uh, was a group of fellow Union POWs that were also inside uh, Andersonville, and they victimized the other inmates. Uh, they were primarily uh, cutthroats and thieves that uh, were bounty jumpers. And when I say bounty jumper, it's not like modern day bounty jumper definition. If they were uh, a bounty jumper, you, if you were uh, compelled to enlist in the army, if you didn't or, or wasn't able to serve, you could assign someone else for a fee to serve in your stead. And what these bounty jumpers would do is they'd take the money, they'd sign up under a bogus name or whatever, and they'd just flee. They'd take the money and run and uh, never report for duty. And then they'd go to another place and do the same thing and keep doing it over and over again, taking these people's money. So I, when they finally were captured, they were sent to the Andersonville prison. So they, uh, they would victimize the weaker inmates. They would, uh, uh, when the cry would go out, fresh fish, that meant that there was new prisoners coming into the gate. They would go to the northern gate, usually where they went in. They'd go to the northern gate, and they would uh, try to spy uh, like-minded individuals that would join their ranks or look at the other prisoners, the weaker prisoners, and see what they had and take what they had. And they'd wait till nightfall. They'd follow them around, and they'd wait till nightfall, and they'd attack them and take what they had. And if they fought back, they'd, they'd beat them or they'd cut their throat and take what they had. And uh, so they were the scourge of the inmates of Andersonville. Uh, and the book will reveal how that the, the Raiders eventually met their de demise. The guy on the left is Boston Corbett. Boston Corbett was uh, originally uh, English. He came from London, England to America, enlisted as a private. 
if you notice kind of a, a Jesus vibe to him, he thought he might, uh, well, he was uh, extremely religious. He was a hatter by trade uh, early in his career. And um, back then, it was expected during the Victorian era, it was unseemly for any man to be seen anywhere without wearing a hat. You didn't go out in public unless you had a hat. So the hat business was good business. And he was a hatter. And uh, in the process of making felt for hats, uh, I don't know if they still do it this way, but they used a chemical uh, compound, mercury nitrate, to make the felt on these hats. Well, inhaling the vapors off of this mercury nitrate had devastating effects on your uh, neurological system. It would cause hallucinations, uh, something they call the hatter shakes, where they would just shake uncontrollably. And you've probably heard the term mad as a hatter. Well, that's where it originated from. These hatters would inhale this mercury nitrate and it affected their brain. And uh, they would do some strange things. They would hallucinate and uh, they were not mentally stable. We'll just call it, they were not mentally stable. The, the photo on the right is Ed McIntosh. Ed McIntosh enlisted as a drummer boy. He allegedly was a office boy for a young upstart attorney in Illinois early in his career, a man named Abraham Lincoln. When he was 10 years old, he was asked by Lincoln to be his office boy, and he, he agreed, yeah, uh, he did that. And then like seven years later, he's a full-grown man almost, and uh, his old boss, President Lincoln, uh, asked for 75,000 men to enlist to quell the rebellion, and he, so he enlisted. He wound up in Andersonville after being captured in Ackworth, Georgia. His duty was of his regiment was to guard a rail station. Uh, and that was the same rail line that was supplying Sherman's army. So it was a big job and it was a tough job. He was captured and sent to Andersonville. When he walked through the gates of Andersonville, he weighed 175 pounds. Uh, when he was helped out, you know, he couldn't even walk. He was 80 pounds. So, and that happened in about a four or five month period. This picture, most of you have already seen before. That's, uh, that, this is, uh, they were planning the, the final stages of the war. This is uh, Sherman, Grant, Lincoln, and uh, Porter. And if you notice, I, I never noticed it until I looked close at it. Uh, those nightmares that I talked about that Lincoln had just prior to his death, uh, he talked about uh, having a dream about being on a ship and heading toward a dark and indefinite shore. Well, if you look behind him, that through that window is a rainbow. If you look to the window to the right, there's the dark and indefinite shore. Okay, uh, the lady on the left, that's Mary Todd Lincoln. And the, the photo in the middle, that's a Civil War ambulance. And the lady on the far right, that's Julia Dent Grant, that's General Grant's wife. And the reason I, I put this up is because uh, there was an incident. I had heard that the reason that the Grants, Mr. and Mrs. Grant, General Grant and his wife, were not in the um, box seat with the Lincolns was because the wives didn't get along. And I never heard what the true story was about that until I started exploring this. And it turns out, yeah, there was a friction between Mrs. Lincoln and Mrs. Grant. And it had happened weeks before the uh, Forge Theater incident. There uh, had been uh, uh, a plan review where the, the president and all of his generals would get together and, and give, give the boys you know, a slap on the back and uh, they would have a parade, so, so to speak. And uh, there were troops bivouacked in the area. And so uh, the ladies were in dresses. They, they didn't need to be dragging the dress through the muck of a, an encampment. So they were, uh, it was suggested that they would ride to, to the parade ground in the ambulance. So uh, Mrs. Lincoln and Mrs. Grant were in the ambulance. So about the time, and, and the president was gonna ride horseback with the generals uh, and uh, review the troops. When the two wives arrived to the site, they're in the ambulance. And about the time they get there, there's a, a pretty wife of one of the generals that's riding next to the president. 
uh, she come unglued. That was uh, a serious breach of protocol. You don't ride next to the president, especially if you're a pretty woman, according to her. So she lost it. And she tried to climb out of the ambulance to uh, take issue with this woman riding up next to her husband. And they had to restrain her. So it just embarrassed uh, Mrs. Grant. And she didn't want uh, to be embarrassed by this woman. But the next day, there was another review. So there, there they are in the ambulance yet again. After lunch, the president rode on horseback two miles to the parade ground while the wives followed again in the ambulance. Mary Ord, the beautiful wife of General Edward Otho Ord, or as I would call him, O-O, <laughs> he rode on horseback <coughs> behind the president and the generals. O upon their arrival at the parade ground, an aide accompanying Mrs. Ord had her join the president and the generals as they rode by in review of the troops. Mary and Julia arrived just in time to see Mary Ord riding next to the president. Mary Lincoln immediately became upset, and when Julia Grant tried to calm her down, she turned on her. And she said, oh, you and your husband covet the White House. You just want to, uh, the White House. You want to replace us. And Mary L Lincoln screamed, I suppose you think you will get to the White House yourself. I don't know that she sounded like it. I just made that voice up. <laughs> but I can imagine it went like, <laughs> Well, when Mary Ord, she turned to the ambulance and saw the two ladies riding in the ambulance, she says, oh, good. I'll ride over and say hello, not knowing what she was about to ride into. <laughs> so she rides up. She rides up. Hello. She she lost it on Mary Ord. How dare you ride beside the president? The men in ranks might think you're his wife, while here I am behind the scenes in an ambulance mired down in the mud. Again, I don't know that that's what she sounded like, but I'm imagining it has some screech to it. <laughs> well, either way, for Mrs. Grant, it was a humiliating experience. She didn't want to repeat it. And when she got asked, I'm, I'm imagining it went something like this. Uh, uh, General Grant, how about uh, you and the Mrs. Uh, double date uh, with me and the Mrs. to the theater? And he, General said, oh, sure, boss. I'll just have to check with the wife. <laughs> and then she, you know, he goes, hey, honey, uh, guess who we got a double date with? And she probably said, not no, but heck no. <laughs> or something kind of like that. So that was why they were not in the booth with them at Ford's Theater. And I, I had not heard this story. And uh, some of the people in the writer, writing group, uh, by the way, there's a writer's group here for those of you interested. But uh, I would come in with a piece that I had written for review for the group to review. And uh, I would read it to them. And they would ask questions. And then it would lead to this little side story that's, so I could kind of fill in the blanks. And, uh, and they would go, why don't you just tell that story? And I said, oh, really? And they said, yeah. So I said, oh, okay, I'll tell that story. So that's the story that, that I added. All right, this is uh, Lewis Weichmann. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on him, but he, he was uh, in the priesthood. His mother wanted him to be a priest. He didn't want to be a priest. He wanted to be a, a pharmacist, but his mother insisted. So he ended up going to a school which trained young men for the priesthood. That's where he met a young man named John Surratt. If that name sounds familiar, familiar, yeah, that's Mary Surratt's son, the first woman hung by the federal government. He, he met John Surratt at school, and they become fast friends. So he ends up, long story short, he ends up befriending uh, Mary Surratt's son, and uh, ends up being a boarder in Mary Surratt's boarding house. And it was his testimony, eventually, that put the noose around Mary Surratt's neck. There were two people that testified against Mary Surratt that probably were the most damaging. He was one of them, and the other one, incidentally, was another tenant of Mary Surratt's that rented the Surrattsville Tavern and Inn, which they moved from. So. 
Let that be a lesson to you landlords. They both, John Surratt and Lewis Weichmann, eventually left the school thinking it, it was not their true calling, but they left for different reasons. John Surratt left the school because his father had just died and his presence home was needed. That left only, only his mother and his sister to run the uh, Surrattsville Tavern at that time. So he went home for that reason. Lewis Weichmann left because he felt he'd been passed over. He, he felt he had been there long enough to be promoted to seminary school and they kept passing him over, so he quit. So he ended up working for the government. This man, portly fellow, is John, Senator John P. Hale. And uh, he was the senator from New Hampshire. He was the, also the newly appointed uh, uh, minister to Spain, which is like an ambassador. I think they renamed that, that position. And it, whenever he had business in Washington, he stayed at the National Hotel typically. And when he came, he also brought along his wife and his daughter. <laughs> this is the National Hotel. And that's the one I was telling you about where they would stay. And this was also likely the first place where John Wilkes Booth met Senator Hale's daughter. This is Senator Hale's daughter. Her name was Lucy, uh, but they called her Bessie because her mother's name was also Lucy. And I can only imagine if there's two Lucys, you don't want to be called Big Lucy <laughs> or Mama Lucy. So they nicknamed her Bessie. She was uh, a socialite. She was like uh, maybe one of the Kardashian girls of her day. Uh, she had suitors. Uh, men, men flocked to her. Uh, she was also secretly engaged to John Wilkes Booth. And her parents, of course, did not approve of her engagement to John Wilkes Booth. Uh, when she was 17 years old, she was described as having had uh, dark hair, blue eyes, clear skin, and a stunning figure. And her manner toward men was a subtle brew of flattery, teasing, and cajoling, of rapt attention laced with hints of indifference, and occasionally a touch of cruelty. Well, apparently it worked for her because she had the boys uh, buzzing around her height. Uh, she had suitors like uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who ended up being on the Supreme Court. The president's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, was also a suitor of hers. So was the secretary to the president, John Hay, and John Wilkes Booth. So whatever it was she was doing, it was working for her. At 10 a.m. on Good Friday, April the 14th, she met, Bessie met John Wilkes Booth with a friend named Carrie Bean for breakfast at the National Hotel dining room. About 10 o'clock, he was a late riser, so he was one of the last ones to get breakfast before they started setting up for the lunch crowd. So he met her there for breakfast on the day that he murdered Lincoln. And as he got up to exit the table, he, you know, he was overdramatic, as always. Grabbed her hand, he, he quoted Sham, uh, Shakespeare Hamlet, Nymph in thy orisons, be all my sins remembered. Incidentally, when Booth, Booth's body was brought back to Washington for burial, one of the few things that was found on his body was a picture of Bessie. This is Four Mile Bridge. When they started collecting all the prisoners of war from Cahaba and Andersonville Prison, their first stop was at Camp Fisk. Camp Fisk is just outside Vicksburg. It's a couple of miles inland from Vicksburg. So they would come across this bridge and they would see the tents in the distance and, and they would just whoop with yells of joy. They finally could see freedom. They would come across this bridge to go to Camp Fisk. The first time they had got decent food, clothes, a lot of them were completely naked uh, and medical care. So the first stop was Camp Fisk. They would, they would uh, stay there long enough to get some food, medicine, uh, clothes, and then they would gather them up and uh, decide to ship them up river. This man, uh, Willie Jett, would have probably, he would have probably been lost to history altogether had it not been for a uh, strange meeting that he had. Uh, it was a random acquaintance that he made. He was waiting at, a, at Port Conway Ferry to cross the river. 
where he met two strangers that came up and tried to make his acquaintance, and they were the two most wanted men in America, John Wilkes Booth and his accomplice. Willie Jett had served a grand total of 13 days in the Army, received a wound in the abdomen. He was disabled from that. And during his convalescence, he met and fell in love with a young woman named uh, Azora Goldman, whose father owned the Star Hotel, which is just beyond the Garrett Farm, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, for the duration of the war, he served as a confeder in the Confederacy as a commissary agent, which meant that he, his job was to get uh, foodstuffs uh, and support the troops in that way because he couldn't serve active duty. All right, when he met, uh, these guys were all standing around. Willie Jett and two of his friends are standing there waiting for the ferry. Davy Harold comes up to make the acquaintance because Booth is off to the side, a little distance away, leaning on his crutch because he had a broken leg. So he's waiting, and uh, he, Davy Harold comes up and introduces himself, and he says uh, he offers him a drink, and they turn it down. They said, we don't drink. So he says, uh, hey, how about helping us get across the river and maybe finding a place, my friend, you know, he needs to lay up for a while. And he, they introduce themselves under an alias. They, they said, oh, that's my brother. Uh, John, uh, James William Boyd, which would explain the JWB tattoo on the back of his hand. He said, this is my brother, and I'm, uh, uh, he'd give him a, a, his alias. So anyway, they're standing there. Booth is off a little distance away while he's trying to befriend these guys to help him get across the river. And uh, they're pointing and gesturing toward Booth as they're talking, and Booth can't hear what they're saying. So Booth hobbles up, and he, he says, I suppose you know who we are, who I am. And they think, yeah, you, he, he was thinking, yeah, you're uh, James Boyd. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know who you are. And he pulls his gun. He shifts his weight onto his crutch, pulls the gun, and he said, yes, I'm John Wilkes Booth, the man, the slayer of, of Lincoln, and I'm worth $175,000 to any man that can take me. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you know, uh, we didn't know, you know, we wouldn't uh, accept blood money uh, for your capture, and we will honor the, the promise that we've made to your brother here to get you across the river. So they eventually help him get across the river. Uh, and that's how he ends up at uh, the Garrett Farm. They delivered him to the Garrett Farm. The, the Sultana... If you look at the picture of the Sultana, this is full of people on every deck if you look at it. Every deck is full. This, this picture was taken, it was the last picture taken of this boat and of course the last picture taken of these human beings aboard. It was loaded so much that whenever someone tried to get onto the boat, you could not step anywhere on any deck without hitting a body. When the picture was taken, this was in Helena, Arkansas, just up the river, uh, down, or actually downriver from, from Memphis. Uh, word got out among the, the passengers, hey, they're taking our picture. They're going to take a picture of the boat. Photographer set up on the bank, and when word among the, the passengers got out, hey, they're going to take our picture, they all crowded to one side of the boat and almost tipped it over. <laughs> The Sultana was powered by boilers, four boilers that were roughly four feet in diameter, 18 feet long. There was four of them interconnected. So if, if, if it shifted, the water would run from one boiler to the next. The, the boat was 260 feet in length, 42 feet wide. So if you put it on a football field, the bow would be like on the five-yard line and the stern would be on the opposing five-yard line. It was a big boat but it wasn't big enough for what they intended. The boat was only supposed to legally carry 376 people. That was their, their max. And the crew was 85, so that meant they could only really carry 290 passengers. This picture was taken. Estimates go as high as 2,500. Most estimates are around in the range of 2,250 to 2,300. That's how many they think was on. They really don't know because they loaded them without really taking rolls. They just herded them aboard onto the boat. The boat's four, four decks. 
You had a lower deck, which had a salon and a, uh, a ladies lounge, which was rare on river boats. And then the next level, that's called the promenade deck. The deck above that, that's the hurricane deck because there's no cover. And then the last one, Texas deck. That's where the pilot house was. They had men stacked on top of every deck in every conceivable place, uh, in lower deck, upper decks, they had it so full. It made it about seven miles north of Memphis. And, and the boilers exploded. Uh, the first one blew, it triggered two more of those boilers to explode and it almost blew the boat in half. The promenade deck had carved balusters, uh, arch spandrels, uh, ornate finials. It was a fancy boat. The lower deck where the lounge was and, and the uh, dining room had fine carpets, uh, linens, uh, crystal chandeliers. It was a nice boat at one point, but it wasn't so nice by the, by the time this happened. There was a staircase that ran from the lower lounge up to the promenade deck, uh, a broad staircase. And underneath that staircase, that, that was where they kept their mascot, a six-foot alligator. <laughs> six-foot alligator was in a crate where the patrons could walk by and, I guess, poke at it or look at it. And it was a strange uh, thing to have on a riverboat. But that lets you know that there were alligators in that river. The men were eager to get home after four years of confinement in the prison, and the safety standards were ignored, and that's why they allowed them to put so many people on the boat. When the Sultana left Vicksburg, the docks at Vicksburg, Epp McIntosh, the man you saw earlier that was so emaciated, he was not on that boat. He was on a different boat, headed to the same direction. He was going to Benton Barracks. He was not on the, on the Sultana when it left, but he was on the Sultana when it exploded and the book will explain how that transpired. The man with the arrow above his head, that, that is uh, Colonel Reuben Hatch. Among all the people that were in charge at Vicksburg and Camp Fisk, there's nobody probably more responsible for the overloading of this boat than this man right here. He was, at the time, he was the chief quartermaster of the Department of the Mississippi. And, uh, he was not very skilled at doing his job, but he was very skilled at, at thievery. He was good at that. And he had been caught several times uh, with his hand in the cookie jar, the federal cookie jar, and, and uh, he would extort money. He would do things like, as quartermaster, he was responsible for buying things on behalf of the government. He would buy up lumber for whatever they needed. He would inflate the invoices and pocket the, the money that he had charged the government over and above what he had to pay for the actual stuff. He got caught doing that more than once. Never served any time, never was brought to justice because his brother, Ozias Hatch, was the Secretary of State of the state of Illinois and also a crony of uh, several dignitaries like Lincoln, Stanton, and General Grant. So he got by with it. The Sultana disaster killed more people than uh, the Titanic, and this book will explain how the disaster was politically covered up and how no one was held accountable, how everyone that was involved in the tragedy got away with it, and um, I thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the book, and if you have any questions, uh, you just go ahead. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. There was one part on the graphics that it said something about um, a layered wedding cake. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Uh, yeah. The boat, the boat, you saw a picture of it. Right. It was all painted white, and it was. <laughs> You know, a lot of people said it looked like a layered wedding cake, the way it was assembled, oh. because it was all frosted white. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Phil, uh, on the exchange of the prisoners between the Confederacy and the Union, were they pardoned on the condition that if they went back home, they would not pick up arms again? Or were they not pardoned and they were just released? They, as far as I knew, it, early on in the exchange program, what, the, what would happen was, I, as I described, they would exchange prisoners right there on the battlefield and they went back right back to active duty if they were able. 
You know, some of them may have been injured or sick or whatever, but they would exchange the prisoners, but they were allowed to go back to active duty right away. The reason I say that is because I'm reading a book called The Law, the Law of His Raid by John Hunt Morgan. Uh -huh. And when he would capture a Union soldier, they would write their names down and then say, you're pardoned, go back home on the condition you not pick up arms again. Because if they caught them again, they'd shoot them on the spot. And most everybody left them went back home. Because a lot of these people were not... They probably didn't want to be in the war anyway, and they'd rather go back home. Yeah, if someone give me that ultimatum, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> I'm staying home. <laughs> Anybody else? Was there a manifest as to who, the prisoners that were on there? No, that, see, that's part of the problem. Um, early, they were, what was supposed to happen was they were going to create a role. They would go through the hospital at Camp Fisk, and they would create roles for all the POWs that were going to be shipped, and they would make duplicate role so that they would be checked off when they left on the train. They had to board a train at Camp Fisk, ride a train, it was like a couple miles, to the loading dock where they'd be put on board. And there would be someone, an officer, waiting at the loading dock with the duplicate role to check people off as they walked on board. Well, under the strain of what was going on and uh, uh, they just wanted it to be over with, uh, they said, oh, forget the roles, you can make them up as you board them. Not knowing that the chaotic conditions that was gonna be at the wharf. So uh, eventually it, it just morphed into like herding cattle on, onto these boats you know, without having a role made up. So not only did they not know who was on board, they had no idea how many was on board. These trains, when they were loading the Sultana, uh, the, the first train, they did okay counting. They had kind of a head count. And then by the time the second load, and it was roughly about 800 men, they think. They don't know. It was roughly about 800 men on the second boat that were never accounted for. And then the, by the time the third train load arrived, and they're maxed out, they don't know how many or who is on this boat. So it's been difficult research for any of the, anybody actually to, to find this, but uh, a lot of researchers went into discovering how many men and who was on this boat. There's still a lot of unknowns. Anybody, yes ma'am? Were there any survivors? Oh yeah, there were survivors. They, I think they fished up, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 to 800. And out of those that they fished out of the water that survived the, the initial disaster, a little over 200 died in the days, hours, and weeks that followed, you know, from injuries suffered from the disaster. So not everyone that was fished out made it. And there were a lot of Tennessee soldiers on this boat. It was roughly 460 to 470 Tennessee soldiers on this boat. And out of those, there was probably around 250 that perished. And then there was even a high, a more that were unaccounted for. They never found their body. One of the bodies they never found was the captain's body of the boat, Captain uh, Mason. They never found him. There was a lot of them that way. What was their destination? They were going to Benton Barracks in St. Louis. That was upriver, and there was a military hospital there. And that was the goal. They, they'd herd them up at Fisk, get them on the boat, get them upriver to a real hospital where they could have a recovery furlough and get, get well. They never made it, of course. But that was the goal, was to get them above the Mason-Dixon line and get them in a hospital. Yes, sir. Didn't they have a, one of the boilers was cracked and they had a very sort of shot Yeah, yeah. That was, that's part of the problem. I'm glad you asked that. Part of the problem was Captain Mason was also a bit of a tightwad and he was hurting for money. And that's what led him to this bribe that he accepted. The bribe that he accepted was he, he was promised by Reuben Hatch, Colonel Reuben Hatch, who was in charge of loading these prisoners, he, he told the captain, he said, I'll promise you as many men as you can carry, but you got to kick back a dollar and 15 cents a man to me. The government contract to haul these prisoners was $5 a man per enlisted man, $10 per officer. So the agreement was made, he would do the kickback and he'd get all he could carry. Now, you ask about the boiler. In the, in the previous trips that Captain Mason had made up and down this river, he had a cracked boiler. 
And like I described, the boiler is like roughly, just imagine four feet in diameter tube, 18 feet long and it's under high pressure. So these boilers had cracks in them and they would patch them. Boiler maker would come and he would patch it, keep patching. They had patched this boiler enough to where you couldn't really patch it anymore. You gotta replace that boiler. Well, wh wh how long is that gonna take? Well, it's gonna take three days. And he's not, he's, he's not going along with that. Three days, all these prisoners will be gone and my uh, bonanza is gone with it. So I need you to Patch this one more time. I'll take care of it as soon as I get to St. Louis. Well, they patched it one more time. And this is the result. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Did they find, or is there a, a site at the explosion that explains that? Now, this is a weird part. You know, you would think the Mississippi River wouldn't change course. It did. Where this disaster occurred was in a bend of the river, and it was in flood stage when this happened, by the way. It was swelled out of its banks. Where it occurred is a bend in the river, and there's a small cluster of islands that's kind of in the middle of it. And under flood stage, you can't see them, but you know they're there. The boat captain knows they're there, so you steer around them, right? So the boat is trying to steer around this, navigate around these the little group of islands that was called Patty's Hen and Chickens. So when he tried to navigate around this, the mile is three miles wide where this happened. He tries to steer around it. It lists to one side, then to the other side. And like I said, when that water shifted through the boiler, it exploded. It was three, now they're looking at a mile and a half swim minimum to the shore. So. But they don't have any type of memorial or anything? Oh, uh, uh, you ask about the site. Yeah. the. Uh, the, the survivors asked for government funding to put up some sort of memorial for them, and they were denied over and over and over. They were, they were finally uh, c collected enough money to put a plaque or a little marker up. And, but now, you know, there's a museum under construction, a Sultana Disaster Museum under construction. They bought the old high school gym, and they're going to expand that. And it's going to be really nice when they get it finished but they're raising money for that. And that's in Marion, Arkansas, which is just on the other side of Memphis, on the other side of the river from Memphis. And where the disaster actually occurred, the river has changed course. Now that site where the boat went down is now, uh, it's either a cornfield or a soybean field. And, and so they're still trying to recover. They're, they're trying to find all the pieces. There wasn't a whole lot left because it, this boat burned to the water line. There wasn't a whole lot left, but they can probably find fragments or evidence of it, but it, the river's not where it was at that time. Wow. Any other questions? Hey, yes, ma'am. Did you ever tell us what the trophy was when they were? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you that. See, I, I kept you in suspense all this time. <laughs> These boat captains would race up and down the river, and whoever won got to display the trophy. The trophy was, drum roll, a huge rack of elk antlers mounted on the smokestacks. <laughs> See the little cross brace between the smokestacks? They would mount the elk antlers and that let all the boat captains know that, yay, I'm a NASCAR champion of the Mississippi. <laughs> yes. So that's what they did. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Anybody else? That's a question. Yeah. They, they're boarding in Arkansas and they're on the Mississippi. Now this, the boarding happened at Vicksburg. Vicksburg. Vicksburg, Mississippi was where they boarded. They made stops as they went up the river. They're headed north, right? So they're going against the current. Okay. And they stopped. They made a stop in Memphis and they picked up some people. Okay. They picked up and unloaded. And, you know, every stop, there's something. They're moving stock or board more, more people as they go up. But, yeah, they, they had, the majority of the people were boarded. Yeah. Yeah. Vicksburg is south of Memphis. Yeah. No, he wasn't racing when the, the he, he was so loaded. That'd be like trying to race with an elephant on your back. You know, he, no, he probably wasn't. He was probably, uh, Captain Mason actually was, there's documented evidence that he was really worried about uh, the condition of his boat and the loading of it. He had even had to have uh, braces put between the decks because they, would start, they had sagged so bad under the weight. And they were afraid that, that the decks were going to collapse 
and hurt somebody. So they had stanchions, which is just a big brace uh, between the decks to support that extra weight. They had animals on too, right? Animals. I'm sorry? They had cattle and horses on there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, after the disaster, uh, that was the lifeboat to some of these guys. They were grabbing onto the manes and tails of horses swimming because they didn't know how to swim. So they're, you know, that was how a lot of them stayed afloat. Yes, Cindy? So it just seems, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like you've had even additional backstories and added information. That That's because of you, Cindy. You were the one that sure. made me tell the side story. Yeah. Do you have enough of that that you're going to do a prequel or a sequel or a little backstory? I, I don't know. What, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> When's it coming up? Yeah, it was uh, uh, y'all. This is Sandy. She's uh, there's a writers group here at the library. Those of you that are, are writers or aspiring writers, I meant to tell uh, tell y'all this, but there's a writers group that meets here in this very library, and it's a great group. Uh, got sharp eyes and even sharper pencils, and if you've got something written, they can help you make it better. And uh, uh, some of those people are in attendance here tonight. I'm so glad that y'all came, and they helped me improve. Um, the garbage that I brought to the group, you know, made it something readable, and it's been a lot of fun. And I would come in, uh, as I was saying, they, I'd come in with a chapter or whatever that I had written and read it to the group, and it would lead to some sort of discussion. They'd start asking questions, and they, and I would go to explaining, and the, and the explanation would kind of veer off the path a little bit, and they'd say, well, "Why don't you tell that?" Yeah, okay, I'll tell that. So I did tell that, and then Sandy wants me to tell more. So, uh, so maybe I put it in the book. Maybe I didn't. You got to read the book. <laughs> yeah. Was there any children on the boat? Yes, there were. Um, let's see if I can point this out. On on the promenade deck, that's that deck right there. The promenade deck. There were uh, individual cabins. Not many of them, but there were individual cabins that you could rent for a higher price if you were able to pay the extra price. It was a small space, maybe eight, eight foot square or 10 foot square. And it had a, a bunk bed, uh, a Windsor chair and a cuspidor. And so you were, you know, you were special. So there was uh, several children on the board, not many, but there were several children riding along with their parents. There was a guy that just got, he had just been uh, furloughed or whatever out of the army and uh, him and his wife and, and young child were going to celebrate and take a boat ride. And so, yeah, there were children, sadly, that perished on this boat. Uh, and one of the victims, by the way, just reminded me, uh, one of the victims of the, the disaster was the mascot, the alligator named Buford that was in the crate. <laughs> one of the prisoners, he went to after the boat was on fire and everybody's in the water and screaming and yelling and trying to swim and uh, by the time this, this guy named William Luganbill made it to the railing, uh, he's looking around for anything that he can use as a life preserver or something buoyant. All the shutters and boards and rails and gangplanks, they'd all been taken by other people, and he cleverly, cleverly remembered Buford. <laughs> so he grabs a bayoneted rifle, stabs Buford a few times, said, you know, hey, it's either Buford or him. It drags Buford out of his crate and used his crate as a lifeboat. It saved him. He, sa he kept a piece of that crate, took it home with him, and carved this image of an alligator and did something else with it. Uh, William Luganbill saved by an alligator. It's in the Tennessee State Museum. So that piece is there. It is cool. Is that another side story for you, Cindy? All right. Any, uh, yeah, Mary? I encourage everybody to read Mrs. Lincoln's Dressmaker. It shows what a piece of work Mrs. Lincoln really was. Yeah, I've heard stories about her, about how she was like fingernails on the chalkboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was difficult, they say. I don't, I don't know. She was probably a sweet lady. It was just misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Miss Lincoln. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, maybe a future writing about the survivors. Just say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, several of the survivors did write write books and accounts. Uh, there was one guy named Chester Berry who became Reverend Chester Berry, and uh, somehow or another he was able to collect stories from a lot of the survivors himself. He corresponded with them and said, uh, "Send me a picture if you got one. Send me a picture and, and your account." Of, what did you see? What happened? You know, what did you see happen? What's your account? And he collected these letters over a fairly long time and compiled these into a book. And a lot of, and like the, the story about William Luganbill stabbing the alligator, it's in that book. And I, and I used that book as part of my reference material to help create this book. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Henry Winder. Was he related in any way to Carrie McGavick, who, who was born a Winder? That was I know. I didn't know. I didn't even know her maiden name. To be honest with you, that she was a Winder. If she was, it's possible. I guess I, I've not traced that genealogy, but that I don't know that I'd want to know that I was kin to him. You know, <laughs> given the the situation, you know, and what people thought of him, I don't know that I'd want to claim him as kin. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, again, I, pre I really appreciate y'all coming. It was nice to see familiar faces and uh, people that I love uh, come tonight, and I can't thank you enough. And uh, I hope y'all had a nice Thanksgiving, and you have a great Christmas. And uh, y'all drive safe on your way home. 